Becky and Phil will take us on a trip. Photographers journey through some of the natures of wonder of Costa Rica. Thank you, Vince. We can handle it from here. Uh, okay, give me a second to take care of the logistics, share the screen. Share. Sound. I have my passport in hand. I'm ready to go. Okay. That's good. That's good. I hope you have your vaccine passport too. Uh, yeah, I have that one too. Okay. I'm going to move this over onto our second screen. And I'm making this up in the PowerPoint slideshow. Okay. Can you, uh, Bruce, can you see the screen that Costa Rica? Yes. We're good. Okay. We're good. okay. And you can Probably. hear us fine. And you can hear us. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But why don't we introduce ourselves a little bit? You might know Phil. Uh, I'm Becky, obviously. And uh, Phil and I started out as bird watchers, nature lovers, and that took us traveling to Costa Rica at first. Phil got into photography, particularly nature photography. Eventually, I joined him in that effort. And so now we, frequently, we go there uh, to photograph nature. So Phil and I have gone to Costa Rica about nine times, different trips, different places. And so we're going to cover several of those trips. If all goes well and we can travel, we'll be there a tenth time in December. So uh, our, our programs follow a pretty set format. We do PowerPoints for about 45 minutes, and we have a very short four-minute slideshow of Costa Rica slides set to music, and then we'll take questions. Okay, I like to set the scene geologically of where we're going. Costa Rica is right here, sandwiched between Panama to the south and Nicaragua to the north. And as you can see, it's got a mountainous spine right down the middle and a big Caribbean lowland here. This is the Caribbean and a Pacific lowland here. Uh, the mountainous spine mostly volcanic up here and then really old mountains down here. But it's really part of the same chain of mountains that goes all the way up into the Rockies and down into the Andes. You can see that the Cocos Plate is sliding underneath the Caribbean Plate. And what that causes is volcanoes. It's abducted down, it heats up, pressure mounts, it melts, and it rises up in the form of magma and volcanoes. So that's how all these volcanoes in the Pacific Rim of Fire are formed. The nice thing about this is that it gives a real variety of topography. You have the mountains down the middle, you have really moist wetlands on the east and the west, you have a dry area up here, you have elevated highlands. These are about seven, eight, even up to 12,000 feet. And San Jose, the main city, is right here in the elevated highlands, uh, kind of a temperate climate. The Spanish explored Costa Rica in the 1500s, and the first permanent European settlement uh, was in Cartago, in that central highlands that Phil was pointing to in the mid-1500s. Uh, the, the Costa Rica had its, its independence from Spain in 1821. The population of Costa Rica is about 5 million people, 50% of whom live in the urban areas. 40% live in San Jose, in and around San Jose, uh, the capital. Uh, it's set apart from its Central American neighbors insofar as it's politically stable. It's, it's, uh, it, it abolished its army forces in 1948, although it does have a, a, a police presence. Uh, not not onerously so, but that's what they have instead of, a, of an army. They have internally a police. Uh, it's got a relatively high standard of living. The GDP per capita for Costa Rica is about $12,200. Guatemala is only $3,400. And the U.S., of course, is about $65,280. Whenever we travel to a foreign country, we like to look up the GDP per capita to get a sense of uh, the standard of living of the country. For Central and South America, 12,200 is pretty good. Right. Uh, however, compare that to the US of 65,000 GDP per capita, you can see that it's still a relatively 
developing third world country. Its major economies are agriculture, technology, and tourism, particularly ecotourism. And it's also got well-developed social benefits. Uh, the education is, the, it's got 98% literacy, it's got good health care, well, relatively good health care. Uh, a friend and guide of ours who grew up in the United States but lives in Costa Rica, married a Costa Rican woman and lives in Costa Rica would say, you know, if I have any special medical needs, I'd probably go to the United States. But it's also got uh, sanitation for all and electricity. That doesn't mean if you're out in the real boonies uh, that you won't find people living without some of these conditions. You know, we travel to Costa Rica because the nature is great, but also because it's relatively civilized. The roads, you know, the roads are, are pretty bad compared to U.S. roads, although some of our roads are heading downhill. <laughs> but you know, compared to Belize or Nicaragua or Guatemala, the roads in Costa Rica are, are pretty good. Nevertheless, Phil and I generally will go on a tour, whether it's a small tour that we put together, but we'll have a guide, a driver, at least, uh, just because it's easier to have someone who knows the country and speaks the language well to be able to negotiate. 2006, we, we put together a trip, mostly us and our photographer friends, bird watching friends, and we flew into San Jose, went all the way down the mountain spine, practically to Panama, flew back to San Jose, and then went up to Arenal, the uh, major volcano, and went home. So that will be the first trip that we cover with you, some of the sites. So Phil talked a little bit about the, uh, the neighbors of, of uh, Costa Rica, but also you should know it's a small Central American country. It's about the size of West Virginia or Denmark. Uh, but it does, as he said, because of these mountains running down the center, and you've heard Phil describe the diverse uh, different kinds of uh, environments it has, but also that creates a diversity of flora and fauna. Seasons here are tropical, uh, the cl uh, tropical climate year round, but it's cooler in the elevation. So as you go up in these mountains, sometimes you'll get down into the 40s at night. The summer or the dry season is generally December through April, and the winter or the rainy season is May through November. Except for the, <laughs> uh, the Caribbean coast, we've been to Tortuguero twice. And the Caribbean coast doesn't have a dry season and a rainy season. It has a, a rainy season and a very rainy season. And it's, uh, it's extremely wet on the Caribbean coast. Still a nice place to visit. Okay, for us, all tours start at the Hotel Bougainvillea. Uh, it's got 10 acres of garden, a good reason to go there. It's a good place to decompress after you fly into, if you're flying into San Jose. It's out in Heredia, one of the suburbs of San Jose. Uh, it's, it's got a lovely room. It's a high quality hotel from Costa Rica or San Jose standards. It's a place where a lot of people go for special occasions, weddings, etc. So you know, the middle picture is a picture looking down into the gardens. They have a like tower that you can go up into. And the bottom picture is looking out the front of the hotel. Uh, basically, you look over the highlands and there's a, a cart from Sarchi. Sarchi is a town going towards the west coast and they're known for their beautiful painted carts and wheels. We're on our way to our first lodge, which is Rancho Naturalista, a very famous Bergen Lodge, although not as good for photography some of the other places we've been to. This is our guide. Th this particular trip we contracted with a, a uh, Costa Rican company, Arizantes, and they put together all the logistics, gave us a guide, a uh, really wonderful guy, Jose Calvo, and, uh, and a driver in a van. And they put together the lodges and did an internal flight within Costa Rica for us. And so the first stop here was at a place where if you wanted to, you could buy some uh, sugar. Uh, it's sort of molded into a cone. You can eat sugar. It wasn't our thing. <laughs> and also we stopped at a, ho a restaurant up in the mountains and that center picture, well, these actually these two pictures about uh, some of the Sarchi wheels. And in the middle picture, they're actually using it as a table. And here we are at Rancho Naturalista. That's our first lodge. You can see here's San Jose. Here are the mountains going down. So Rancho is on the Caribbean slope of the Cordillera. Uh, so you're facing the, the Caribbean and it's comfortable but rustic. And in fact, most of our accommodations are, are pretty similar. They're comfortable, they're clean. 
Completely rustic. So they're echo lodges. It has about 15 rooms. As Bill says, it overlooks the Central Valley, Irisu Volcano, Turiaba Volcano. Not that these are active, right? I no, they're know. not. These are right. not active. Okay. But it's got mild temperatures during the day. It can be very rainy or rainy. And when it's rainy, the, again, when it's rainy in the rainforest, the, um, the paths become muddy and slick. So you got to be careful. But it is a bird watcher's location. It has been for decades. It's got over 450 species of birds on the property and surrounding areas. And it's about two, two and a half hours southeast of, of San Jose by car. You can see this, this uh, worker is putting out fruit during the, the birds. Many of the birds in the tropics are fruit eating, fruit avoiding. And even the, and the animals. So, you know, even if they'll eat insects or uh, lizards and stuff, uh, or they'll, most of the things will go for some kind of fruit. And then on the far right, there's a picture uh, of the hummingbird feeders that track the different hummingbirds. Different locations, different elevations, different uh, uh, habitats, we've got different kinds of uh, hummingbirds. Look at the local butterflies. Uh, this one in particular, I'm not even sure how to say, Thurius menander. Uh, when you get to when you get to tropical butterflies, they don't all have common names, so you, you struggle a little bit to figure out what they are. Sometimes you're just happy you can get them into a family. That's right, or, or a genus. genus. But this one, right. this one is really unusual with these transparent wings. They have a whole genus of, of uh, butterflies down there with these transparent wings. But sometimes called clear wings. Clear wings, right? The the butterflies in the tropics are just gorgeous. So the crimson patch is a typical one. You can get that in Southern Texas and the malachite can also get up through Mexico and in Southern Texas as well. So they're more tropical warm weather uh, inhabitants. The next lodge has a very different habitat. We're up at 7,000 feet in the cloud forest. This is the Trogan Lodge in the Saavedra Valley. The leader stated another lodge in the Saavedra Valley. But here, we're way up in the mountains, just on the Pacific side of the Continental Divide facing the Pacific, but really pretty high up. So this again is about two, two and a half hours southeast of San Jose. Uh, and the terrain is rugged and vertical. Okay, so here you, at the bottom left, you see the, uh, that's the main lodge. And on the top left is our cabin, which was up the mountain. Up about here or so. Yeah, quite a, quite a hike to haul your luggage. Uh, and of course, you know, there's no elevators, <laughs> you know, lugging them up paths. It was, um, it was challenging. But it, it also, because of its location as a valley, in the valley, uh, we only get sunlight. The, the sunlight really starts to hit the valley from like 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So it's a short time for that, which is sometimes good for uh, nature photography. Uh, but it started out as a trout fishing location. And they still stock the, the, the stream and the uh, little ponds here with trout, which they serve in the uh, restaurant there. But, well, go, go ahead. It's called the cloud forest because you're always in the clouds. I mean, the, the uh, warm, moist air coming from the Pacific rises up the mountain slope and it condenses in clouds, rain, fog. And it's, it's quite dramatic in the morning. You can see the fog roll in sometimes. And to, to expand their clientele and to really attract more echo tours, and particularly at first the bird watchers, they really planted their gardens to attract more insects and birds. And so now they're also known for echo tourism. Here's our gang, birders and photographers at work, uh, out looking for something. I'm not sure what we were looking for there. One of the reasons we go to this area, to this particular elevation, to this area, is for the resplendent quetzal, our target bird for that area. With that nice, the males have that beautiful long tail, which is part of their display during a courtship. Uh, and the, the area, well, there's a lot of farms in the area, and they've encouraged the farmers to keep the avocado trees that, that these birds feed on. And that's why they come to this area, or one of the reasons they're in this area. And so to compensate the, the farmers for keeping the avocado trees, when they bring visitors, the, uh, the tourists, to see the respondent quetzal, of course, then the farmers is given some to us to come on their land and see that. The only problem with the avocado trees is, you know, when you shoot a bird <laughs> uh, with a camera, 
you want it to be in a nice clean setting well these avocado trees are so damn cluttered that it's hard to get a clean shot but that's the best we could do for that trip but just to give you an idea when you're up at these kind of elevations and you're also in the cloud forest uh, the temperatures range anywhere from like 77 degrees as high to 44 degrees and it can be rainy and damp and it can be cool and at least in one lodge we were really happy to find the dehumidifier because other than that every morning you'd wake up and it, your room was just full of moisture and nothing would dry but that that was very helpful we would wake up and it would be so moist we have moss growing on us <laughs> And now we went farther south. We're almost to the border with Panama. Here's the border with Panama, and we're right here, just north of the border. We're at Wilson Botanical Garden, and it was established by Floridians, Catherine and Robert Wilson, and eventually turned over in 1973 to the Organization for Tropical Studies. Along with the area around it, it's got about 860, uh, 860 acres of habitat, and it's used to do a lot of studies uh, in conservation, you know, they have uh, different kinds of uh, plantings. Uh, the building on the bottom right is the main building where you would eat. You eat, uh, you eat family style, which is great because you get to meet people. And frequently there are people from all over the world, whether oh, what happened there? There we go. whether they're whether they're researchers or volunteers who have come to help work in the garden. The upper left hand building that is it may, uh, it may look like an outhouse but it's not. We, we've been told that it looks like an outhouse but that actually is our room well half of that is our room one of those doors goes into our room which again are modern enough clean uh but simple so here's some examples of the of the plantings that we saw there just a smidgen and these are pretty typical in the uh, rainforest and in the tropics you have beehive ginger the one in the center the one that looks like the cone going up on the far right people might recognize banana flower which also is a fluorescent flower uh, and and draws nice birds and stuff to it for pollination and then the lobster claw heliconia on the left which you'll see throughout the tropics too Okay, the other kind of uh, fl flora that you'll see frequently are epiphytes, and this is an example of an epiphyte. They're basically air plants. They grow on the surface of plants. They gather nutrients from the air, the rain, they trap soil, and they're typical of ferns. You can see ferns growing here. Bromeliads, that's what the red flower in the back is that's peeking out, as well as orchids are typically in this mix, and that little yellow flower is probably an orchid. Oh. Okay, so a lot of times orchids in the tropics, when they're growing wild, are epiphytes. They, oh, by the way, they don't harm this, the tree. They're not parasitic. Crown, you know, we, we trimmed a lot of the bird photographs out because, you know, you're not all birders. But I, I left some of the prettier ones in. And this is just a gorgeous, one of the prettiest species that we've seen in the tropics. It eats insects and lizards, but will take fruit. So, so because it'll take fruit, it'll come to feeder. I, sh I shut this one out of feeder. Now we have a little story here. Uh, we were on our way back to San Jose, uh, taking a flight, and this was our airport. And our, our niece, the one in the, the center, the young person here is our niece. We brought her with us, and we were all going down in, in separate SUVs to, to this airport, such as it is. And as we come over the rise and into the airport, into, into the airport, <laughs> our niece, we weren't in the car with her, but the, the person, our friend with her said, told us as soon as we get over the rise and our niece sees this, this dirt runway and this, uh, this, this bleachers, term, the this, bleachers, believe this terminal, <laughs> she, she said to our, our friend, my and uncle are crazy. I put it because we put this together and you know this is this is the airport we were flying out so the way this worked is we wanted to go back to san jose so that we could head north of san jose we're very far south now so they arranged for a small plane 11 seater that's what you see at the bottom uh to take us and of course that meant we had a really 
Uh, we were only allowed to have 25 pounds of luggage each. So what happened was the night before, uh, we loaded up our big luggage and it went on the bus and the bus driver took our bus back to San Jose. We stayed overnight, had a nice meal, and then got up and went on the plane and met him at the airport and then we drove farther north. Um, this was also very interesting. This was the first time that I saw an airfield that worked quite like this. I mean, I've been on other small air airfields, but you know, there's no stand, there's no office. What happens is a woman drive, comes up in a taxi. She's driven in a taxi. She gets out. She goes over to our leader. She shows him the manifest of who's supposed to be boarding. He, he checks them off and says, yep, 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 they're all here. And she runs, she goes off and we wait for our plane. And first a bigger plane comes in, but it wasn't our plane. <laughs> we figured that was the drug plane. Right. And then comes, then comes another plane. And everything worked out well. We had a beautiful flight. Yeah, it was gorgeous. To, over, over the uh, West Coast. We fly back to San Jose, and then we go up to Arenal, uh, a volcano. It's a live volcano. It hasn't really been active in recent years. And this is the town at the base of it, La Fortuna. And this picture was La Fortuna in what, 2006. Two, in 2006. You can see all the pay phones were there. And this little boy, I thought he was funny. He was, he was trying to make the two phones talk to each other. Not that anyone was on the phones. But everyone comes from the town came to use these phones. We went back recently, like about a couple, years ago. a couple of years ago, probably 2019 or so. These, the bank of phones are gone. Everybody has cell phones. And then we leave La Fortuna and we head up to Arenal Observatory Lodge. And we sent a picture of this sign, probably this very picture, to Becky's sister, who is uh, the mother of the niece we had with us. Just to show her we were taking her daughter into a, a zone of high volcanic risk. Not that we had any issues. But the top picture is a picture of the uh, Arenal volcano from the, our room across the gardens of the lodge looking at the uh, volcano. The volcano is about 10 miles away, I think. And, and it's across. I thought a, a, it was 1.7. Oh, I'm sorry. It's 1.7 miles away. And it's across the lake there, Lake Arenal. Both those pictures are from our cabin. Now we're looking at our cabin. Whoops, come back. So this is where we stay. Just the, the gardens around it, the grounds are unbelievably beautiful. And you can see here San Jose, and we're now going northwest of San Jose. This is Lake Arenal, and the volcano is right about there. You can see we've come down an elevation, so we're going to get a whole different set of birds and animals. And then a day trip up to the Rio Frio, uh, the river that is at the border with Nicaragua, where we took a, a boat trip uh, for a, a half a day. And like kids everywhere, the kids are playing in the river. Now you start to wonder, maybe they know this is a better part of the river, I don't know. But this is a, the right side is a typical idea of the river, nice, smooth, usually slow moving, and you have some good views of the area. And you also can get closer to some of the, uh, the vegetation on each side where a lot of the uh, animals and birds. I'll show you some, uh, some wildlife pictures now. This is an anhinga spearing some kind of fish. Uh, we have anhingas in Florida, South Texas, in the marshlands. If you go to the Everglades, you'll see anhingas. I thought this was a terrific picture. I, I took a couple of photography club awards with it, made a big enlargement of it, framed it. And then I decided it's probably not the best picture to put on the wall in my room. So some pictures are good for one purpose, but not good for another. In addition to some of the birds, we saw some black mantled howlers. Uh, they're they're more they're not so much at the highlands. These are lower uh, lower elevations, but these are their typical monkey. Uh, they're world monkeys. They're known as howlers because of the noise they mo make. They have a a voice box that's made so that they can as loud as lions. lions matter of fact the first time my niece heard this wasn't in costa rica but we were hearing them and hearing them but she didn't see them and they did sound like lions until she finally saw them and i remember years later she was visiting my mother her grandmother and there was a show a, a nature show on the radio and they would play a sound at the beginning of or at some point during the show and he asked me to identify what is this and there was a, they had a howler monkey and she knew right away she said oh grandmother that's a howler monkey <laughs> but anyway green iguana basilisk lizard 
Okay, so the green iguana is orange. Okay, this is a male. He's in his breeding colors, so he's advertising for the females. But he's got those beautiful colors. But if he wasn't breeding, and the females will be green. And the bottom one, the basilisk lizards, uh, you can see them. They they sort of have like they look like little dinosaurs in some ways because they got all those little tiny things going down them. Um, but they're also called Jesus Christ lizards by some, and I don't mean to be blasphemous here. But the reason they're called that is because they have really large, uh, big feet uh, and large toes. And when they're young, their bodies are light enough to go with those large feet, and they can actually look like they're walking. They are walking the while water. they're skittering they, across they, they the water. They skitter across space, you know, on, on top of the surface tension. Right. This is the reason Becky was wondering why those kids are playing in the water. These spectacle came in their alligator family uh, lizards, and uh, they're big, and these guys were just sunning themselves, but they're certainly in the area, in the river. We took a bunch of other land trips. By the way, we also took two cruises. Uh, so we're, we're small boat people, small ship people. We took two cruises with National Geographic slash Lindblad, and they usually uh, go through the pa actually three cruises up and down the Pacific coast and through the Panama Canal on two occasions. And one of the occasions took us over to, over to Tortuguero. Uh, two occasions. Two occasions we were over to Tortuguero on the Caribbean side. We don't, we don't really have many pictures from those in this PowerPoint, but we do have some of the cruise pictures in the really short slide set to music. So you'll see a few of those later. So this picture, uh, this map is depicting uh, some trips we took in 2012, 13, and 2016. Uh, two of the trips were the same, uh, at least two of the trips. They're the blue stars, pretty much the same itinerary. We liked it so much we went back. And we went with our favorite photographic leader, um, Greg, Basco. Greg Basco. And the, th the three red stars on the southern part were another trip we took them in a different area. Also with Greg. This is, this is where Greg lives. There's a topiary there. Uh, this is in Sarcero. And we decided to take this picture. <laughs> well, a couple of pictures you can see. There are a number of uh, shots of us merged in. Becky uh, suggested that, and uh, we executed it in Photoshop. It was a little fun. But we started the trip again in, in the Hotel Bougainville. I the same, a similar picture of the of the hotel from the back from the gardens, but then we have a picture looking out into the gardens at night, and there are some statues in the gardens, and this is me talking to the man on the bench. You know, if you go to Costa Rica and you fly into San Jose and you need a hotel, uh, we really recommend the Hotel Bougainvillea. If you're with an organized tour and they're staying in another hotel, then you stay where they're staying, but if you have any choice, Hotel Bougainville is a wonderful place to stay. Well, especially if you like the nature, but it's also very relaxing. You know, it has all the amenities. So, uh, but we don't get any we, we don't get any kickbacks from them, unfortunately. Although they like to welcome us back. Okay, so this is the typical transportation we have, and this is our bus driver generally. His name is Jose, and Jose drives the bus with the snorkel. You can see the snorkel uh, exhaust on this because we do ford uh, some streams and stuff periodically. We're up at Laguna de Lagarto, Nicaragua. So this is the border with Nicaragua. It's a very poor area of the country. It's it's hot, humid lowlands. Um, you know, the houses here, they're kind of ramshackle. It's just a very different atmosphere than it is in the more prosperous areas of the country. And the roads are dirt roads. Uh, so, you know, the coming and going there it is uh, more challenging. And, uh, but it is, a, the reason we go there is because of the wildlife. You, you just, the birds, some of the birds and animals they have there, you just don't get in other places or unless you go to similar kind of habitats. You know, the, uh, the rooms, well, the, well, this, this by the way is uh, one of our cabanas and that's our friend David Desrochers who happens to be on this call. So a photographer in Canal Walk. Well, Phil teases me because I like to take pictures of the of the kitchens. And usually these places, you know, as simple as they may be, we generally get wholesome and decent food. We don't always get high cuisine, uh, but this was the kitchen and the women in the kitchen, as you can see on the upper left. And then the upper right was where they would send out the food, lay out the food for um, a buffet style. 
And, uh, you know, it was a very simple fare. Generally, you know, there was at least some rice and beans and something else to eat. And, uh, but this was our, our home uh, for a while. The, uh, the temperature is anywhere between, say, 80 and 90. Humidity is 100%. No air conditioning in the rooms. They do have a little rotating fan. But we had nice hot and cold water, et cetera. And we had all the, we had the basic amenities. The, the, the kind of situation you tolerate for a couple of days because the wildlife, the bird life especially, is just so wonderful. And believe me, if you're going to do a trip like this, you go to someplace like this first. Get that Get hot sticking is out of the way so that you can eventually go up into the mountains and cool off. And this place can have a lot of rain. And that's what helps make it so green. Here, here's our group, a bunch of our photographer friends from any trip that we put together. And we're all shooting the birds that are out at the feeders. You'll see some pictures of them. Our, you know, our friend Greg Masco helped set this, uh, worked with the, uh, the owners of this lodge to help set up some bird feeder systems that made it possible for us to keep birds right from the balconies. This is our limo. Uh, this, this, uh, we went out to the manager's house, maybe a mile away, and this was the vehicle they took us in. It's not something I'd want to travel more than a mile or two, but I think it had to go through inspection in the next year. We were wondering how it was going to make, it. but the man sitting in the doorway on the left is our guy, Greg. And you can see that we shot some unusual stuff there. They have uh, nectar feeders set up in the rainforest. And they were hoping to get hummingbirds in the rainforest, but the hummingbirds didn't come. However, at night, bats came. So we went out into the rainforest, set up our tripods, and photographed bats. Not an opportunity that we, we have very often. So these are proboscis bats, and they are nectar feeding. They come to these, these uh, bird feeders with, you know, the sugar water in them. You can see, by the way, why they're called proboscis bats. They have this big Little projection man. on their nose. There are a lot of ants in the rainforest. In fact, if you if you freeze dried all of the different species in the rainforest, the one that would have the most biomass is are the ants. And so they are just there are ants on top of ants on top of ants, which means that birds that eat ants are also very plentiful. So loads of woodpeckers. So the insectivores like the woodpeckers, but they'll also come for fruit. They'll come to get the bananas or whatever is being put up at the feeders. You know, the rainforest is moist. It's warm year round, so there's fruit pretty much year round. And insects year round. And, and insects, that's true. Although we've had far more problems with mosquitoes down the Jersey Shore <laughs> than we've had in Costa Rica. That's true. Black sheep and acorn woodpeckers. So you have to look carefully at these two species to see the differences. You know, the one, the acorn has the... Uh, white ring around the eye, the bottom left, bottom right one, and it has the white over the over the beak, and uh, the white other on the chin, and the white on the chin, and the other one has white on the chin, but has a spot of yellow or white right above the bill, but it's got darkness through the eye, and it doesn't have that white eye ring. Budios, uh, budios are hawks, kind of stocky hawks that like to soar. There is a budio or two that hangs out in Canal Walk. Uh, the main bird that soars around here, the big dark colored birds are turkey vultures. But which are not beautios. Which are not beautios. But, you know, uh, once, twice a week we'll see a red tailed hawk, which is the, the local beauty oak. How about the red flag hawk? Red tails. And uh, that's the common beauty here. But these are some of the beautios. The road sidewalk is the very common one okay. down in the tropics. You'll see them like we see red-tailed hawks up here. And you'll see them on the roadsides, but if the road is basically a, a, a river, like the one we were down in, in uh, near Nicaragua, you'll see them hanging out on the sides of the of the rivers as well. The white hawk is a, is a little, is a, not as common as the roadside hawk. Two cans. Okay, so uh, uh, these are a bird for a lot of people that's uh, a target bird, something they want to see. And photograph. And photograph. The one on the right, is the keel-billed toucan. The Fruit Loops bird. That's right. The one on the upper left, well, it's, we think it's currently, Phil looked it up, it's currently called the yellow-throated toucan. It's had many different names. And actually, there's sometimes there are different varieties depending on which country and how far north and south you are. 
The bottom one is an arasari, the collared arasari. So it's a smaller version of a toucan. It's, I guess, in the toucan family, but it's our, our toucanets, but it's just small. I've still got a really big bill. Great. Cascades are very common. This is in the flycatcher family, a little, little crest. They're very colorful. They make a lot of noise. We have a uh, flycatcher, not a cascade, but we have a flycatcher in Canal Walk. As you're walking around Canal Walk in the wooded areas, you'll hear and sometimes see a great crested flycatcher. We've, we've... You, you want to say what it says? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to imitate any calls for you. Okay. Tanagers. So there's lots of tanagers in the tropics. Well, this is just a couple of them. The upper one's a summer tanager, which you can see in the United States. If you're in New Jersey, you're, if you're going to see a tanager, a red tanager, it's probably, probably going to be red with black wings and it'll be the scarlet tanager. And the bottom left is the blue gray tanager, a really pretty bird. And this is a backyard bird in Costa Rica. Very common. And then there's the golden hooded tanager. Some people call them the seven color tanager, although I'm not quite sure how you get seven colors. I mean, it's in purple and turquoise and gold, etc. cetera. Um, but it's a really colorful. Honey creepers are a kind of tanager. They're smaller. They have these down curved bills. They're adapted to feeding on nectar, sticking those bills into flowers. But they'll still come to the feeders too. And this is a red, all of these are red leg honey creepers. The, the one down here that's more green is probably a female. That's what they typically look like. This one, the one up in the upper right, is of a mature male. So he's got all that blue and black and, and red legs. So is the one on the bottom right. And the one, in, I think one in the middle and the bottom is also a mature one. And the one up in the upper left, well, that looks like a young one who's going from being a young guy to be getting his mature uh, feathering. Orioles, also fruit and, and uh, fruit feeders. There's a Baltimore Oriole. We get those in New Jersey. Although I, I haven't seen, we haven't seen them in Canal Walk. No, we'll have to keep our eyes on. And then the Montezuma's oropendula. Oropendulas are a tropic species. Uh, we, we don't we have anything like that in, in Florida or South Texas. Uh, and this bird is the Montezuma's oropendula, just a particular kind. Oropendula, named for oro, golden pendula, the tail, the hanging part. And it uses that tail in its courtship display. So the top one is it's starting its courtship display. It's making its liquidy no, uh, vo vocalization. It's flapping its wings. It's hanging onto the branch. And then it's going to flop over like in the bottom display his tail, and then write itself. And he'll do that. He's trying to attract a mate. Green-necked wood rail. These are chicken-like birds. Uh, and again, feed on fruit and insects. Uh, you often see them uh, near the water. And then we get one of the stars of the tropics, red-eyed tree frog. Everybody loves to see red-eyed tree frogs. Well, they're so colorful. We like to see them but too. But they're also that has something that has to be handled carefully, since they have, you know, their their sensitive membranes. They need to be kept moist and handled well. And again, because the tropics is warm and moist, uh, amphibians are very common. They they like warmth and moisture, otherwise their skin right. dries out. And some of these, look at the uh, this heliconia that it's on. You can see that those kind of bracts that's going out that part, that red part. It actually has a cup in it, so it'll collect water and it'll collect incense and all, all the life in it. Sloths. These guys are fast. <laughs> so they're tree dwelling mammals. You can see they're hanging from the tree. The one on the left is three toed tree. Uh, I'm sorry, three toed sloth, and the one on the right is two toed. The toes, the difference is in the front claws, not the back. They both have three toes on the back. And also, you can tell the difference by the facial patterns. They hang in the trees, they eat leaves, they come down to. Um, that's about it. About once a month or so. And it's that's also the dangerous part for them when they're down on the ground. Now we're on our way, uh, we're leaving that lodge, and overnight we had a torrential rain, as you can see. This bridge, such as it was, uh, half of it's gone. Half of it washed out. So you can you can tell the story. Okay, so uh, we actually so we got we decided this was the best way out, uh, or this was the way that's going the way we want to, and the bridge still could be crossed because the half that was there was still soft enough to take 
you know, one vehicle at a time. However, the local people are demonstrating because they don't want them to just fix this bridge. They want a new, better bridge, a real, that, bridge. A real bridge that won't wash out every time they have these rains. And that's what they're doing. So it took a bit of negotiation and a bit of time. They had, they were, they were taking the big, big truck that was bringing the, the Coke, the beer and the water, bottle of water that was going to try to cross there. They couldn't do it. And so they were unloading that truck into pickup trucks, which could cross the bridge. We had to wait for all that to happen and our guy, our driver negotiated to get us across so we we made it but it was a a bit of a delay we were on our way to the macaw farm for lunch so this is the farmer he runs a farm here and he's been feeding the macaws the wild uh, macaws they're not they're not pets right they're wild macaws he's been feeding them peanuts for years so they become acclimated to him and habituated and sometimes also they they bring him macaws that are the need to have a special care that you know that are injured or whatever so he has some of those also being rehabilitated um but the farmer they know when the, the macaws know when he comes out. He comes out with a can of peanuts and he calls Loro, 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 meaning parrot, 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 which calls her big parrots. And so he calls for them to come and they come over to him. And then he will walk, he'll feed them a little bit and he'll walk across the field and do the same thing and they'll all fly over. And that's our chance to photograph <laughs> the macaws. And you can see scarlet macaws are just beautiful birds. They're also hard to photograph. They're flying by pretty quickly, very close to us. And, and they're big. <laughs> and they're big. And at, you know, out of every couple of hundred shots, we maybe get one keeper. But we persist, and uh, they're just gorgeous. We also had a, a, a green macaws. The scarlets were by far the majority, but there were some green macaws in there. And then we're up in the cloud forest. So now we got out of that heat and humidity and went up to the cloud forest where we got cooler but also humid. So we're at 4,700 feet of seas and uh, the family, they established the biological cor corridor uh, in a central volcanic area. So from here, we did some, uh, we've photographed some of the, uh, particularly hummingbirds, but some of the birds and species on their property. And we also took day trips to other places at slightly different elevations, because as I said, elevation gives you different habitat and gives you different birds, particularly different humming, although there's some overlap are some endemics that are at different levels. A large waterfall. This is 250 feet into an old volcanic crater. And just a, a beautiful setting. There's a restaurant there, an open air restaurant, where we set up our, our feeder stations for hummingbirds as well. But first we photographed some of the local scenery. And uh, we were there, I think, in October. So this is the uh, beginning of the rainy season. So it is not the height of ecotourism. And that also meant, though, that the, the uh, restaurant could be available to us and their grounds to do photography. We pretty much rented, not pretty much, we rented out the whole restaurant. So they closed it down for us. The mountain streams, you know, we're up in the mountains and, and the streams are scenic, uh, really beautiful settings. And this is a sample of us doing hummingbird uh, photography of one sort. So this is one where we have some backgrounds. The hummingbirds are not tame and they're not, they're wild hummingbirds, uh, but they, you know, they feed them. They, they have all the beautiful gardens with the right kind of flowers. Um, along the way, our guides will collect some flowers that they know hummingbirds feed on. Uh, and so they come to the feeders as well. So we know the hummingbirds are coming into this area. So after the hummingbirds are coming into the feeder and we set up our flashes uh, to get the right exposures and capture them, um, and we figure out how we're gonna focus for them, uh, then we replace the feeder with the flower and then the birds come in. And you can see it's very hard work, you know, once we have it all set up. Here are our friends, Kathy and David, De Roche, Canada Walk residents. You sit there with a, uh, your camera on a tripod, you have a cable release, you can have a glass of wine in one hand. Or a cup of coffee. Or a cup of coffee, and as the birds come in, you shoot them, and you, you your timing is good, then, uh, then you get some nice shots. We'll show you some of the shots that we got. 
Okay, so as I said, the hummingbirds will be different at, depending on the level of uh, elevation. The black-bellied hummingbird is, is endemic to one, you know, uh, one set of elevation. Violet saber wing is a larger hummingbird that you can tell from these pictures, uh, but it's a common one in that area as well. Green hermits. That's a big one. The green hermits big it has that long down curved bill, and it also has a long tail. Well, actually, the males have a long tail. The females have a shorter tail. Oh, the, the left side, the purple-throated mountain gem, is another small guy. And the green crown brilliant is a little larger, probably more about the size of our ruby-throated humming. Right. Now we're up in the Talamaca Mountains. Uh, again, very high up, 7,000 feet. And, you know, the uh, in clear air, Every thousand feet you go up, the temperature drops five and a half degrees. In, um, in moist air, it drops three degrees. So you can see that by the time you're up at seven or eight thousand feet, you're 20, 30 degrees cooler than you would be at a, a lower elevation. Would you say this is an endemic to that area? This is. It's only found up in this area. So we, it's, it's a gorgeous hummingbird, and we we're very happy to find it and be able to photograph it. I know when we went there, I think before we went there, we were really hopeful that we would, we would see them and we would be able to photograph them. Little did we know that, you know, when they're there, they're in that location, they were probably, they were, they common, were, they were yes. common in that location. In that location. Right. And we shot snakes. Well, the one on the top left is the tropical timber rattlesnake, a very deadly. And a very big snake. Right. Seven, eight feet, something like that. Yeah, big and big and fat. Yeah, he's thick. Uh, okay, so uh, that one we took at a herp zoo, a herp ecologist zoo, and I'll call it a zoo. But it's um they raised and rehabilitate uh, snakes and amphibians, etc. And when we started, they started with the less the lo the smaller snakes, the less um, poisonous snakes. But by the time, and the, and the son did them. I mean, he was an adult, a young adult, but he did those first set of snakes. But if I did them, back yeah, in he, he handled, handled them. them. He set them up, he took them out of their cages. He set them up in a nice position or whatever the, um, whatever we were gonna shoot them on. And he put them away and all that. And then later on, Papa comes out, the more experienced herpetologist and to handle these big guys, like the the more dangerous, the timber rattlesnake and the stuff, fertilance and the bushmaster. Bushmaster. Okay, and the one on the bottom right is a palm pit viper, also venomous. But this one was caught by uh, one of the local people who lived near one of the lodges, and he said, "I got the snake. Do you guys want to shoot it?" And I'm sure we paid him some and he helped position it. Of course, this was not a planned shoot, so. Um, to get the flash right, one of us, well, one of us was shooting, the other one's holding the flash. I don't, I don't know if this is Becky's shot or my shot, but if it was my shot, I'm photographing it, and Becky's standing holding the flash above it. Well, not quite above it, but and if close it's, to it. <laughs> if it's uh, her shot, then I was holding the flash. And these, uh, the, these next two were also at the Herp uh, Zoo, uh, the Golden eyelash pit viper, and you can tell by that triangular head, another pit viper, but a very beautiful um, yellow golden colored snake on a heliconia. And the green parrot snake on the bottom is not poisonous, but probably could give you a good nip, but a very pretty little snake. And then we're down in Playa Dominicalita on our way to the Osa Peninsula and some landscape shots we did there, a sunset over the Pacific with the palm trees, just a beautiful spot. And then a couple of uh, leaf cutter amp shots. I, I mean, when you go to the tropics, when you go to the rainforest, you're going to see plenty of leaf cutter ants. And these guys are amazing. I mean, they're carrying multiple times their body weight in, in leaves. They don't eat the leaves, by the way, they kind of munch them up and feed them to, I think, a fungus, mm -hmm. and then they feed the fungus to the queen. Uh, it's a whole complicated process of fungus farming. But it's a fungus farming, so it's there's symbiotic, uh, some symbiosis with the uh, the ants and the fungus. The fungus get the benefit, and so does the ant. A couple other creepy crawly things, tarantula and a scorpion. You know, I don't really care for spiders, so this was 
really good practice for me to kind of get down on my belly just a foot or so away from this thing and photograph it. Yeah. Good practice. The scorpion is a typical thing that you see in the tropics. And uh, for Phil and I, uh, the first time Phil and I went to Costa Rica, we were up in Monteverde, not far from Maranal, on the other side of the of mountain range. And it's a, it's a, a cloud forest and it was a birding trip. And we went into our cabin after dinner and there's a scorpion on the wall. Big and, scorpion. And we're not too, we're not too keen about this. So Phil says, go down and tell our leader who's down in the uh, down in the restaurant. Uh, restaurant tell them about the scorpions so i went down there and our leader's talking to the owner and blah 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 and they're they're chatting away and i interrupt a little bit and say oh, we'll need some help there's a scorpion in our room and they just looked at me and said just leave it alone it's fine and i went back and told phil that well next thing you know our whole group not our leader but all the the other tourists were all in the room catching this scorpion because I did not want to step on it at night as I went to the bathroom. White faced capuchins. Again, New World monkeys. Uh, by the way, you know, they have a prehensile tail. World War monkeys in Africa and Asia don't. Uh, very flat nose with side facing nostrils. Uh, th these are characteristics of New World monkeys. And this looks like a, uh, a parent and child. I'm not sure whether it's mom or dad. Right. Poison dart frog, poisonous skin. When when our guide caught this, he put on uh, latex gloves. Uh, their skin has some toxic substances in it. We didn't want to harm him either. And then Tour de Guero, this is on the Caribbean. Uh, just some of the local birds. Agami herons, by the way, are really unusual. This is not a great shot, but it's a great bird. And any any bird watchers in the audience would know if you go to tropics and you get to see or better yet photograph an agami heron that's a good opportunity and the boat built heron in the upper left it has a really good size um, bill i mean that's a nice size bill and it's big like that to catch things like frog and then the bare neck tiger heron and the tiger herons are a type of heron um they usually sit along the marshes and stuff and they sit up like that and then and, you know while they're, while they're hunting but they have the, their tigers by because of all the beautiful striping on them. And our last slide is Becky hard at work on the Osa Peninsula. And she's overlooking the Pacific. I have to tell you, it's very different in Costa Rica than in the US. Right here, this is the edge of our deck. It drops straight down 100 feet. There's no railing. You don't uh, want to drink too much at night and come back to your deck. That's because sure. this was the way you entered our cabin from this side of the, you know, so we, we made sure we, we knew where we were and not close to it. I mean, it was a nice big platform, at least. It is a spectacular view. So those are our PowerPoints. And now we have just a four minute set of slides set to music. And after that, we will be happy to take some questions. Wait one sec. What is the problem? Aha, wrong microphone. Let's try this. Now let's try that again. Okay, take two.
We'll stop sharing. Stop the share. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So if you have questions, this is a good time. Or comments. Or comments, questions or comments, feel free. You'll have to unmute yourself, hold down the space bar. Phil, can you tell us what kind of shutter speed you had to use for the slaw? For the slaw. For the slaw. Oh, that was moving <laughs> real fast, Tim, real fast. We were probably shaking more than he was moving. <laughs> <laughs> to get him to smile, that was really impressive. Yeah. That, Actually, that's them. They smile. They always look like that. That is that's, their facial pattern. That's because they're so relaxed. <laughs> Great job, people. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Phil and Becky, could you comment about the economy and the nature of Costa Rica? Because um, I ran into some expats uh, who retired down there. So it's a unique South American country, I mean, or Central American country. Uh, that's true. I think because of the stability of the country, uh, relative to a lot of other places, I, a lot of uh, people do look into retiring down there, primarily on the western half towards the Pacific, so also the not so rainy part of the country, a very pretty area. Um, and in those areas, they have built up communities, not that Phil and I visit any of these, by the way, they built up communities that are expats and have uh, services, et cetera, that will uh, cater to them and and be available. I don't know though how their health uh, system is and in any case, even in those areas. My guess would be a lot of U.S. expats there probably would come back to the U.S. for significant medical treatment. Our understanding is there's one really good hospital in San Jose, which is where most of the expats go for any kind of uh, somewhat specialized treatment. If they really have a serious issue, they fly back to the States. If I remember correctly, though, the educational level of the population is almost the highest of uh, Central America. I mean, As I said, 98% literacy. Yeah, that's quite high. Sethis, I think you had a question. Yeah, I, you know, you have a passion and you're devoted to taking beautiful pictures of the birds. I mean, the birds, you have the life and you have the birds. And uh, we could see that. Uh, I was wondering if somebody doesn't know how to handle a camera and wants to go to Costa Rica to have a really nice vacation. Uh, so what would you, will be your recommendation and what time will be ideal to go to uh, San Jose area and some of the other uh, tourist spots? I think if you if you wanted to go to Costa Rica and you weren't, you know, most of the trips we go on now are very small, half a dozen at most 10 participants with one or two photographer leaders, because that's what we like to do. But, you know, there are more general trips to Costa Rica, general nature trips, National Geographic uh, runs trips there. And, and in fact, our first time there was with uh, what is now Nat Geo. Uh, well, also, and, and they'll, they'll incorporate not only nature, but culture, history, uh, so you, you can start, you usually start out in San Jose, the capital, they do some cultural stuff, they take you to some historical sites, they take you to the Museum of Gold, etc, things like that, but they also will take you into the, the into nature then. Not yet, no. Say that? Go ahead. Go okay, ahead. Uh, they'll also take you out into the countryside, into the various nature, but you'll see different things as you go through the country. Uh, there are different areas, and they also have uh, each area has its own unique culture. Well, I mean, no, it's I'm a fine with everything. Uh, Rudy, do you want to mute yourself? Uh, yeah, I, um, when we went to Costa Rica, we went to Manuel Antonio National Park area, yes. and I didn't happen to see that in your presentation. And I was just curious of whether we picked the wrong place to go and the only time we went. To... There were actually some pictures in there from there. The I uh, see. Scarlett McCall landing was from that area. And I think one of the sloths was from Manuel Antonio. Antonio as well. But we you know, saw sloths there, yeah, and uh, found the whole place very hot and humid. But it, it, you know, well, Manuel yeah. Antonio is hot and humid. Uh, but you know, you go there usually on a day trip from uh, San Jose, and most of the 
most of what we talked about were the the longer trips that we took but we did we take spent that, three days there three days in manuel antonio you probably grew moss on you by the time you were done <laughs> It's a little drier there, but uh, that we actually saw it from uh, Lindblad ships where, you know, they took us in for uh -huh. uh, an excursion from the ship. That's right. right. So we've been there several times, but never more than, you know, a couple a hours. Well, right. actually some areas around there we went and we had like picnics and stuff like that. We had a lunch there or something and, as well. And, and you would recommend uh, Bog and Velia as the- uh, Oh yeah, as, absolutely. Uh, well, as a starting point, eventually, as, as Phil said, there's several good companies that will actually take you on tours if you'd like um, and, and you know you can join a tour or you can create your own depending on you know how many people you want to go with um, and uh, as Phil said Hor Horizontes which was with an H H O R I Z O N T E S Horizontes was always good I don't we haven't talked about them or talked to them lately but there's some others as well um, Limblad and that Geo run tours uh, some people like to do it on their own. Phil and I just like to have someone local to help negotiate any problems that come up. And set up all the logistics. You know, um, I don't really like to handle all the logistics myself, so I prefer that somebody else do that. We do often give the directions about where we'd like to go, what kind of habitats we want to see. Thank you. Years ago, uh, we went to San Jose and then flew to Capos to go deep sea fishing for a number of consecutive years. Absolutely phenomenal views from the airplane and out there was just amazing just amazing amazing topography and the people and the food and the fishing it was wonderful and of mm. course if you're a surfer a lot of them go to the pacific <coughs> that's true that's my group any other questions Phil and, and becky if you are not a photographer mm -hmm. can you get some decent pictures by using a cell phone or do you, or do you have to have a, a specialized camera? You're, you're not going to get, whoop, oh, there you are. You're not going to get decent pictures of birds uh, because you need a long lens to do that ideally. A telephoto. A telephoto, but certainly you can get good pictures of landscapes. And flowers. And flowers. And flowers, flowers, people, flowers. locations. Uh, so there's a lot of things. Matter of fact, for the first few years, Phil was taking the, you know, the DSLR or whatever. He had a regular camera and I would take a, a pocket camera, basically. And my job was to take close-ups of the flowers, the people, the places we stayed, stuff like that. So, you know, you can come home with a lot of different things. Just not close-up of small birds. Well... I thank, uh, we thank all of you for having us. It was a lot of fun. It's nice to see so many of our friends and neighbors on, on the call. Thank you. It was fantastic. It really was. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you for a job well done. And uh, now I don't have to go to Costa Rica. I, uh, <laughs> oh, yes, you do. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I hope we could do this again some other place. Okay, take happy, care. Happy to do it. Thank you.